So in this piece, I'm using different kind of tunings, actually. And I did think a lot before starting to write about what is possible. And that was also one of the advices uh, Garrick has uh, gave me. First of all, his best advice, whatever sounds good, is is good is going to be good, right? <laughs> that's the best one ever. <laughs> whatever sounds good is going to be good. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. you can't argue with that. <laughs> So you're on the, the jury for Score Follower, right? Yeah. So I remember, I probably something I should mention right off the bat, because me and Artun were talking about Score Follower, and I was saying that I was unsure about the curation practices of mm. Score Follower, because every time I'm on that site or on the YouTube channel, I realize that they all kind of have a similar aesthetic. But then Artun was telling me <laughs> on the show that, you know, there is something about curating a certain aesthetic or group of aesthetics. And actually, like mid-show, I think I even said so on the show that I actually agree. So I changed my mind on the mm -hmm. show, I guess, because if you're not curating at all, then what are you doing? You're just kind of having a hodgepodge of stuff that you're not yeah. making a decision about what you like and what you don't like. So now we have someone that's actually on the jury for this. So this is cool to actually <laughs> see the behind the scenes of what happens. Yeah, at some point I was I wasn't sure if I should say that, but then I found out that our names are on the uh, Score Follower website, so it's okay. It's okay to so say. So it's okay. That. Okay. Yeah, um, but I think there are two tiers to that, you know, because first the Score Follower founders they actually choose people uh, they want to contact and they're, they ask to adjudicate. So that's the first level of cur curation that happens. Because we, as adjudicators, we can just um, yeah follow our own judgment in choosing the pieces. Choosing, I mean giving them points because we g give them points and they get um, summarized at the end and, you know, the pieces that got a lot of points, they usually get considered uh, to be published and those who got low points, they, they don't. So that's basically it. But then we are also um, curating it somehow right through our own um, preferences and music. Through your own contacts because I want to backtrack a little bit. You mentioned that you guys, as the adjudicators, you contact people that you like their music. Is that what you said first? No, or no, how no. does that happen? And the, actually, how, what's the first point of contact, I guess, with the, with the compositions themselves? Well, so there is a call, right? And um, the people who started uh, Score Follower, they usually make a spreadsheet for us. Um, so once it's decided who's the in the adjudicator team, uh, we get one month um, to look through usually 200 or more pieces each, each Wait, of you us have, gets. you only have one month to go through 200 pieces? Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's why I, I didn't make it to the end sometimes, so. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. It's a lot. Also because, you know, it would feel shitty if you can't really look closely on someone's work. And I always try to um, at least look at like five points in the piece and listen to at least half of it and then read sometimes the performance notes. So we have 200 pieces and then we go through them and at the end of mo the month, um, score follower uh, team just um, looks through our um, the points that we have given to the pieces and then they decide who's who's getting it and who's not who's going to have a video published and how many adjudicators are there um it depends but at least eight ten people oh, that's a lot yeah, yeah that's a lot of people and all eight to ten of these adjudicators are supposed to look through the 200 pieces it's not like some of them have 20 and the other have 20 and it's like you all are supposed right. to listen to all of them um, no, because there is usually more than 200 pieces. Um, sometimes there's 600, sometimes more. So you're so, assigned 200 out of the 600-ish. Yeah. So you don't even hear the other 400. No, there is, that's why there is always responsibility to kind of try to go through your 200 the moment you start with number whatever it is, oh 156, God. and then you go through, try to go through 200 pieces. Yeah. Wow. 
And then they have the adjudication. There's the point system. So what exactly is, is that, can that be public? What, what exactly are the points I'm that you're sure it's pretty clear because it's not just like, yes, no, there is something in between where you can be like, I'm not sure. So if other people really like that piece and you're like, not really sure if, if it should be on score or not, um, it could still be considered because if other people um, give it a lot of points, you know? Yeah. Well, of course, yeah. If, if a few people don't like the piece, but a, a few other, I mean, more people like the piece, I mean, of course, it's going to be, yeah. it, it's going to be more considered. Yeah, it makes sense. And then if everybody likes the piece, they'll put it on score follower, I'm assuming, right? Right. And out right. of those, let's say if there's 600, just to put it, an example of number, how many of those get chosen to be featured on the channel? Now, quick pit stop to let you know that I do offer one-on-one -on -one consultations and lessons in regards to anything composition related. This can range for helping you put together your portfolio for any composition degree that you're applying to, or you might want to improve your creative chops as a composer from week to week or month to month, or you might want to get a better handle of the behind the scenes of what it's like to be a composer. How do you sell your sheet music? How do you negotiate commission rates? How do you apply to contests? How do you apply to grants? How do you do anything as a composer, let alone just writing the music? So if this is you, you can contact me using the link down in the description below. Um, quite a lot, actually. I can't really say no, um, because we usually don't get the number. We just get, from what I remember, a list of names just before it gets uh, mm -hmm. published. But I'm pretty sure at least 50 people, if not more, that's a lot. Yeah. That's more than That's I thought. Quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. 50 out of 600. Let's say 50 out of 500. Just to make the math easy is like 10%. Yeah. So that's pretty good, actually. It's most contests, it's like way less than like 3% or something or right. that kind of thing. Yeah. So you have a good chance of getting your yeah. piece on score follower. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I follow it, obviously. And it's one of the more followed you know, new music channels, whatever you want to call it, in our little niche field. So I think it's important what you guys are doing, obviously, for new music and that kind of thing. And I know you have some music also featured on it. I think one of them is this piece here, Fever Dream uh, Made Manifest, right? Let's yeah. listen to a couple minutes of that. We need a looking turkey. Turkey! With all natural ingredients, a few cherry tomatoes. Tomatoes! Simple and delicious seasoning. Ingredients! I really like this piece for vocal ensemble Ekmelis, right? Is that how I pronounce the name? The Ekmelis. vocal Ekmelis. Right. I always Ekmelis screw up vocal that. ensemble. I, I think always that's screw their up their name, form. yeah. But they're like the only vocal group, and I 
believe on Anna Walton's episode, we had an mm. example of their singing style in her piece. And it was completely different, obviously, than what you did. But also this caught my ear as well, because I, there's some of these sounds in this piece I've never heard uh, before. Oh. So I would, I mean, I, the, the excerpt, just so, just so you know, because she doesn't know what excerpt I, <laughs> I took out of this, is this part where uh, you're talking about, you know, don't use the word socialist or something like this. And then it goes into this whole thing about the turkey like Thanksgiving turkey and, and this, this kind of juxtaposition I thought was really funny. Mm. And um, this whole part about um, you're different and how um, they would have the text you're different and, and all this stuff about the word different, but then you would have this like IPA, uh, these vowels that are like in unison with the text. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never seen that done before. So that whole that whole like, you know, going from this thing to that thing to this thing all in a row was for me just like a very different experience. And um, I guess the last thing for me, at least listening to this is that that first part, the socialist part, the harmony in that is so insane. Like I had to like look at the score really close and like try to figure out, I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on, but it just, it just made so much sense mm -hmm. with the text. And I mean, it would just be great to hear a little bit about this piece. And I'm just going on and on and on because I like the piece so much. But yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, do you mean the socialist part where um, tenor and... Yeah, tenor and the, the low the, the low voices, they're doing this kind of uh, half half notes one after the other. Yeah. Um, and it's like all this very intense quarter tone harmony uh, going on. Mm -hmm. like how did you how did you even think like, okay, first of all, the text, but then I'm going to set it in this way. Yeah. I mean, I do sometimes treat the text symbolically and maybe I should explain where I, I took the text. So I, during pandemic, uh, you know, I got addicted to reading news and I have New York times subscription and I would just read it for like hours the very moment I open my eyes, okay, I look at my phone and I read in bed. The worst thing you can do to feel like mentally okay for the day, you know, yeah. just reading news. And at some point I just started screenshotting some of the articles um, uh, that I found interesting or, you know, the text was just so shocking in a way. And I usually, so how I work or how I get ideas for my pieces is, I do save a lot of materials from different sources. So I also have folders on my computer where I have screenshots of pictures or texts. And I also use some of the, those texts um, there, so not just news. But I also um, experimented a little bit with AI. That's oh, okay. pre-ChatGPT era. Um, vintage <laughs> yeah and they were more interesting in a way because they were they would generate really weird uh strange texts um depending on what you input it but sometimes you would ask them to write a story and it would be really kind of fantastical a little bit um yeah sometimes inappropriate actually which you can't do now with chat gpt i tried it recently i was like um, tried to write a, a, a dialogue um, with an angry customer and ChatGPT was like, I'm, I'm sorry, but I cannot do that. I cannot put negative emotions or blah, really? blah, blah. Yes. Yeah, so it's really vanilla. I didn't even know that you can't do that in ChatGPT. Yeah, I can't really talk about aggressive things or, you know, um, yeah. That's pretty shocking, actually. There was a case recently that... Um, Someone tried to write something mm, xenophobic, or the response of one of those AIs was was xenophobic in a way, and the company had to adjust uh, the AI, the algorithm. Wow. Yeah. So I think, unfortunately, we have to be. <laughs> so you were able to PC. get some of these. One of these. Um I mean, these phrases that you had, I mean, were they all generated this way? No, so the example is the uh, you're different. That's mm -hmm. actually generated by AI. 
Um, I think I just input it maybe the first sentence, you're different, and then it started just generating this really strange text about that had actually a lot of meaning in the sense, you know, I, I could relate to that just like thinking about myself as a foreigner here, but also how it is to be like feel a little bit different um, just in general. So I was really surprised by, by the result of it. But yeah, the text is just a blob of all these different sources. Um, and I talked to uh, Garrick about this piece a lot, and he helped me a little bit with the direction of the, of the text, because I had probably twice as much text in the very beginning to start with. So when you and Georg, by the way, are mutual uh, teacher, so I've been having a lot of people lately on that have been uh, students of Georg Haas. So a yeah. lot of different ways that uh, he has been influencing us. And mm -hmm. actually with text, I, I haven't talked to him much about text because I just haven't been writing a lot with text. So I'm super curious how he helped you dwindle down all that AI generated text to, to what you used in the piece, because in this excerpt, these are only like three different sections of text, but there's a mm. way more stuff in this piece, even though the piece is only like, I don't even think it's like 10 minutes, right? There's yeah, way, something. yeah, there's like way more different uh, pieces of text in this mm -hmm. than just these three. So it's a lot of very different moods and angles of, and things like that. It's not like a narrative that you would get from an opera or something like this. It's right, it's very right. much like here's one thing, here's another thing, here's another thing, here's another thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, how did he when he told you that you're gonna, or when he helped you dwindle it, was it f for making it into a kind of an arc, or was it like how did he how were you able to get it down to these, you know, small yeah. number of pieces? So I I did prepare a list already. I. Uh, got rid of some of the redundant text that I thought not it's not going to work. Um, and, you know, some of the texts are kind of political, especially the ones that are spoken in reverse, but nobody can actually understand what it means because obviously unless you reverse the recording and listen to it listen back or you're looking at the score because the score right. says play. Yeah, yeah exactly um but some of them were political and you know it's been such a hard time during the pandemic just being in america in a way and i Definitely don't understand everything about the politics here. And I was just trying to understand it. But there was a lot of upsetting things going on, especially with the president and, you know. And um, I had these texts and um, I guess what he helped me with is getting a direction of, you know, really analyzing what these texts mean and giving me advice how to, like, treat it. So what he said was to be more personal with them. So kind of accumulate them in a way that I, that, so the kind of common thread between them is me, is my experience, and not really specifically talking about another person or a politician or, you know, yeah. to be more kind of personal about it. And it really helped me to, to find the right ones and, Actually, when I was composing this piece, I really wrote it in a, a super short time, and I had a lot of fun writing it, which is not always the case. Yeah. And these texts just like fit in perfectly, uh, yeah, within the form of the piece somehow. I mean, I, I do like form that is really, you know, chopped up in a way. Yeah, that was something I noticed too. I think in, actually not in one of the, we'll get to that, well, one of the pieces, it didn't, it, 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 the form wasn't that way, but the, this mm -hmm. piece and another piece you sent me, um, the form was like this kind of chopped up kind of a series of things. But in a lot of ways, it, it makes sense. Um, form was something that we were talking about a lot with Uri. There was like this whole 20 mm -hmm. minute section of form we were talking about. But um and but the idea of form today is is different because most people don't sit through you know 10 minute even a 10 minute piece which we think is kind of short you know in our yeah. in our aesthetic but you know a, a sh uh, more typical length i guess for a, in a concert 20 30 40 minutes but nobody's sitting down and listening so to write a piece with these short little things that go after one another but they all follow the same thread 
SIM card, mm-hmm. a political thread that's personal to you. I mean, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like when I was listening to it, I didn't feel that I needed like this Beethoven kernel to go through the whole thing, musically speaking. Mm-hmm. But the text and the theme, thematic element of the text actually matches well within the whole piece, even though the musical elements are, at least to me, on first listening, very different between each section. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think that's what this excerpt captures the best, I think, because you have three very different musical renderings of three different texts, but all the texts have this kind of constant, um, like, kind of unifying theme in between all three of them, if that makes sense. Unless I'm just bullshitting. Yeah. I could be bullshitting. I'm very good no, at that, No, I'm glad too. you saw this. And <laughs> one person shocked me after they listened to the music. They said, wow, but, like, just every section really flows into another, and it makes sense as a whole, you know? Yeah. So maybe you had the same experience, which I'm really happy about because obviously I do want logic uh, within my form. That's one of the things I'm most concerned about. It kind of reminds me, now that you say that, like imagine like you're on a subway and you're doing a bunch of transfers one after Mm -hmm. the other and there's like a different like street performer or musician or someone (laughs) begging or anything. Like like you're, you're having that experience on every train that you're taking. Yeah. So it's kind of like the same kind of thing, but you're doing it so fast. And they, but the experience of those people on the train, you know, kind of soliciting or doing whatever, those people are very different mm-hmm. on each transfer you're doing. I don't know, that's kind of a stretch, but it kind of <laughs> reminds me of that in a way <laughs> with this piece. Um, so. You asked me about music. I didn't talk about music really, um, about this specific fragment with the, uh, you're different. Yes. So I also put a, an effect on um, Elizabeth uh, voice, I think, because she was singing the words. She was uh, actually articulating, whereas yeah. the other two singers were just like doing the vowels. Mm-hmm. Um, and I added this effect to kind of make her sound a little bit like an automaton. Um, What's that? A robot. Okay. Yeah, just to, and and was gradually kind of changing. I don't know. It's a, a really subtle effect. Maybe you didn't hear that well, but I wanted to make it even more strange, uh, because the the text was about being strange, strangeness in general. Um, and I was just thinking how to create this effect of, um, yeah, non kind of non-human voice to add only these. Vowels, that's kind of a strange thing, no? But I thought it was like super cool though. Oh, that's... Yeah, because I've never... Nice. <laughs> I mean, there's one thing looking at the score too, because then you kind of see what's happening under the hood. So definitely like my perception was skewed because of that, because like I see the text <laughs> and then I see these vowels underneath. So of course I'm trying to listen for the interaction between mm-hmm. the vowel sounds and the text. So, I mean, I, I was more hyper aware of it because I'm looking at the score. Yeah. So now I wonder what would have been like if I wasn't looking at the score. And I found myself going through the video and going through the score mm-hmm. just to see if I would change. But I always, I'm a composer, so I always go back to the score because I want to mm-hmm. look at what the score looks like. So I thought that was very, very cool because i just never seen that happen. I don't know if you've seen that done in another score with this idea of like accentuating the vowel sounds through other... You haven't seen that? I don't think so. How did you come up with that? I'm just... (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I think... Well, I was always interested about these kind of... um, How to make sound strange, to be honest. Um, So in my other piece on Carnivalium, I'm actually using videos of automatons. And I think it also comes partially from a technique that uh, a friend of my... um, showed me on flute so you basically sing into the flute and you are not um, producing any sounds with the instrument itself itself but you open the uh, mm-hmm. you just open it up in a rhythmical manner and then it changes the slightly also the pitch but the timbre of the sound that is sung into the instrument and it makes it sound like a robot basically, because the intonation changes, like, really, you know, in a square kind of manner. Really? 
Yeah. That's crazy. So I use it in another piece. And then, um, you know, there are other pieces that inspire me. Um, who is the composer? Um, German composer who made the speaking piano. Speaking piano. He visited us here. Yes. Oh, my goodness. How recently? Oh, my God. I can't remember. I don't know. I mean, that's the piece I like from him. Um, so just, you know, how how using vowels, um, consonants can actually imitate the human voice. And then somehow, I guess I, I came up with it. I don't remember seeing it anywhere else. Yeah. Hard to explain where, where I got that. No, I mean, that's uh, well, that's what makes idea. composing really fun because sometimes, especially as another composer looking at an, a, a different composer's work, like yeah. it, it makes you think like, oh, you know, like that's a really cool idea. And how do I, how do I implement? Now I'm thinking in the back of my head, how would I do something similar, you know? Mm -hmm. But of course, the right project has to come along for that to happen but it just it makes you just start things like that make you start the like the hamster wheel going going on yeah. in your head so that was one of the moments um and the socialist mo moment too for me uh the hamster wheel kind of kind of went on so that was really cool um about the socialist moment <laughs> yeah um so that comes from no uh, no theater um my mom actually started later in her life um the astrology, I don't think it's a thing here, but definitely in Germany and Poland. So she did a master's. It's basically musicology, but for theater. So you're not really doing theater. You're um, writing about theater. And she was really obsessed about no theater, the Japanese, you know, 15th, 16th century um, traditional theater. And um, we actually went to a play when I was a teenager, uh, once we visited Japan. And she had DVDs, and it's such a powerful image and such a powerful sound once you go to a performance. It's really, really specific. There is a lot of silence. There is a lot of sounds made by the movement of the actors. Um, there is a small kind of ensemble that is on the stage with the actors as well. And uh, performers use their voice as well as their instrument to perform. Um, so it's a, it's a very specific art, but this type of singing where you have, um, you know, multiple people, at least two people singing basically the same melody, but slight, with slight differences mm -hmm. was some, something that came to my mind, um, when writing this fragment, I wanted to be, and you know, the, the sound, it makes the sound really vibrant in a way, very interesting timbre. So I wanted to use it to amplify the, the text. That makes a lot way. of sense. You're doing it with Western notation too. I mean, it's mm. like extremely Western notation using half notes and then using, I mean, little quarter tones yeah. instead of like saying, oh, just go a little higher or, or, or something more less um, exact. Because mm -hmm. the notation is so exact, but then when you're hearing it, uh, it's it is exactly what's how you're describing it. So mm -hmm. I just it was I don't know for me at least because I'm very interested in quarter tone harmony, especially yeah. it was just it pricked my ear. So of course, yeah. maybe now I w would use six tones mm -hmm. because then after that I brought the piece for six tone harmonium. Mm -hmm. You know, so now I maybe I would change it to six times maybe go a little lower a little, <laughs> lower, a little tighter i mean with yeah, that. yeah yeah, yeah I, I find myself going tighter and tighter and tighter <laughs> as well <laughs> so and that uh, pisses off a lot of musicians i feel like but uh, if you have a good reason to do it like you do then why not if the language makes sense right if it's possible for the performers which it is mm -hmm. then yeah sure and especially for an ensemble like ecma is because they're specializing in microtonal music in general yeah. Yeah, I mean, speaking of microtonal music and that kind of thing, because now you got us on a nice little, <laughs> nice little uh, oh, segue no, I here. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> um, this other piece that you have, which you just sent me, and I listened to it this morning, but I, I really love this piece uh, called "Fungible Memories" for a string quartet and electronics or playback. Is it more um, playback? It was samples. Yeah, it was more fixed. samples, more a playback kind yeah. of sound. Let's hear a couple minutes of it. Thank you. 
So like we're talking about microtones here and obviously you have a very specific way of working with them. Mm -hmm. It's not in kind of a surface level uh, kind of, okay, I just want to have a dissonant cluster kind of thing, which I've seen in a lot of pieces, but you're like using it in a very functional sort of way. And this piece, I think out of all the pieces, at least that you sent me, had the most like formal way of using microtones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, we just heard this part where the, there's like this kind of Pasacaglia thing with the string quartet and then you have this piano kind of like coming out of nowhere that's playing along with it, like a duet. And it's like super, super cool. And um, yeah, it would just be, just be great to hear a little bit about how this happened, what the players thought of playing it, like how, how, how easy or difficult was it for them to, to get into the sound world? Yeah, I thought about it a lot, actually. And I just have to say that in the beginning, uh, I mean, a few years ago, I was still using, you know, sometimes quarter tones, actually most of my pieces, but thinking more about timbre and not really getting so much into the systems um, somehow. <laughs> and I changed my mind very recently about this, especially after the piece I wrote for the Music Protocol Festival, the one for six tone harmonium and ensemble. I really changed my mind about just like thinking about harmony um, and using other, yeah, uh, yeah. non tempered uh, systems, you know. Um, so in this piece, I'm using different kind of tunings actually. Um, and I did think a lot before starting to write about what is possible. And that was also one of the advices uh, Garrick has uh, gave me. Just, you know, first of all, his best advice, whatever sounds good is, is, good, is gonna be good, right? <laughs> that's the best <laughs> one ever. Whatever sounds good is gonna be good. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. you can't argue with that. <laughs> And then um, we actually, I talked to him, I wanted his advice on that. Um, we talked about, you know, different tunings, blah, blah, and he showed me some things he likes in harmony on his pianos in his office. But then he said, well, I wouldn't get too much into harmony because all these connection be between chords and directions, they're all different than, you know, the system that we learn um, throughout our studies. Um, the 24 EDO, obviously. And it's just these connections are different and like treating chords in the same way is never going to work out. So I always had that in mind. And I always just try to also write something that is possible to perform and it's going to work out and try to imagine how, how it's going to sound. Yeah. Um, but what I was really fascinated about is something really personal. So I played violin at school, um, and that was my main instrument. And I remember in middle school, I had a lot of problems with intonation. And it was so strange to me because I have perfect pitch, at least um, relative perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. I'm not that great with really high registers of piano, for example, or really low. But anything within violin range is like, you know, okay for me. And I struggled so much. And then I realized that it was because um, nobody ever talked to me that playing with a piano is not going to be the same as playing solo, that I need to adjust to the piano. I need to adjust my tuning and thinking about intervals and so on. So I started digging into literature about playing string instruments and, you know, how there are... Uh, sometimes three kinds of tunings we use. The one we use with playing with a piano and then um, in general, just trying to uh, make some interval sounds uh, within the just intonation, you know, fifths and fourths and so on. And then there is this tuning that we use when thinking of melody and um, leading tones and just, you know, some things tend to be higher when it's an as ascending melody, for example. Mm -hmm. So sorry to get into so many details. About no, it makes this. a lot of sense. Um, and I like that you come at it from a personal perspective too. That's something Georg talks about a lot and something yeah. he also instilled in me too, the, the personal 
angle of it of why would you use these tones just to use them because it's a tr it's trendy no you use it because yeah. it's it's something that makes sense with your past or mm -hmm. your present really right so i wish somebody talked to me then <laughs> they didn't but now at least i discovered it and since it was a string quartet and i was actually avoiding writing for a string quartet which really? is funny huh. yeah because i was I always play violin and I use string instruments a lot in my other pieces, but I never really wrote a string quartet. Well, string quartet is also one of those, I feel like one of those ensembles that composers are scared to write for just because there's so yeah. many str good string <laughs> right. quartets. It's like, oh, I'd rather write for a string quartet and clarinet or, you know, yeah. or a random en ensemble of instruments you know, because it's less pressure. At least that's how I feel when I'm yeah. writing for string quartet. Or I'm like, oh my god! Solo piano piece. A solo piano also that's, is the same wow. thing. Solo piano and string quartet. I think those two are the hardest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So all these thoughts I had, I tried to also like read about it, and then I was like, wow! I discovered this new world in a way. Um, I also have the uh, piano tech. Uh, piano tech, yeah. Yeah, so that's how I made that sample, that piano sample. Oh, that's from Piano Tech. Okay, so you just yeah. you made up your own tuning system in the software, and then you kind of exported it in Logic or something. Or... I just did a quarter tone, mm -hmm. and then uh, I would always lower the the central pitch or whatever, mm -hmm. like how many hertz I want, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I, w I didn't use quarter tone. I used uh, uh, just a uh, normal this temperament. Hurts. And just like lower the the main pitch. That oh, I see. Okay. On, you know? I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't figure out what it was. So, so I guess <laughs> that was successful in that way. <laughs> but you could follow the logic of the of these this two minute thing. You can, you can follow the logic. You don't feel like lost in it which I thought was very interesting. Mm. Like you feel that this is like an actual musical phrase is being is being made between this duet. And, you know, if you go back and you listen to the piece from the beginning, like you establish it with just the strings. So you mm. get used to the sound and by the middle of the piece, like it almost doesn't even feel like there's any wrong notes in the piece. And if yeah. that makes sense. Oh, I'm glad that you... Yeah, it doesn't feel that way. It just feels like... Um, your own language it doesn't feel like you're trying to make a dissonant language mm -hmm. which i feel like a lot of you know middle of the 20th century microtonal music was doing like it kind of they're they're using it in such a way where we're introducing this sound as a as an alien sound mm. that is supposed to be totally against functional harmony right and supposed to be like the extreme version of dissonance mm -hmm. but in your piece you don't do this at all I mean, you're, you're including, it's like very inclusive in a way to use that word, <laughs> you, you know, that, but that's, that's what I feel like the aural, I always talk about aural arguments with my students. Like you, you have a clear aural, aural, uh, argument uh -huh. with this particular piece. Um, and it also doesn't feel like there is as much of the political bent like that you have in the other pieces. It feels like a, there, there probably is though. I'm guessing, but um, <laughs> it's always a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing with your stuff it is, but um, with this piece, it, it, it's not blatant like some of the other pieces. Mm. Yeah, so I found that very, very different than the other pieces I listened to. It was also a bit more personal because, yeah, in a way, it was a, a small tribute to my grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Because my, my Polish grandma passed last year and my Japanese grandma is now gone for five years or so. I was just like thinking about them a lot and and I felt like string quartet is such an interesting form to that allows us composers to be really personal in a way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's for me as a string player too. But I thought, okay, I'm writing my first string quartet I guess I'm going to make it about, you know, my family or my, my experiences. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. And it definitely shows mm -hmm. in that piece. So, um, and yeah, I, and, and I actually listened to this piece without the score first, by the way. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the score, I was 
it was like it, it was so logical after looking at the square i'm like oh wow this is like notated a lot more simply than i thought it was going to be oh which was I really see. interesting yeah i looked at it i'm like oh wow like these are like actual they seem like like normal triads but then you would shift it up shift it down mm -hmm. uh and and the way you notated it too was super super um idiomatic i thought for any player like a player that doesn't even nice. know how to or not trained with quarter tones mm -hmm. they, they could probably play this piece because i know mivo's quartet they are very specialized right. in playing this kind of music but i almost feel like anybody any conservat i mean any conservatory uh trained quartet could pick up this piece and mm. it would be a you know really welcome addition to the brahms or the beethoven or whatever <laughs> else they do so, maybe i'll try it one day <laughs> yeah yeah because i tried to do a similar kind of thing with um, a few quartets uh -huh. that are not into microtonal music and it was uh, definitely difficult uh, the first few rehearsals to get them into the sound world what is the difference you think um with your notation i think yours is clearer because you show that it's part of a certain kind of chord and you're showing like the relationship between one chord and the next chord and but mm -hmm, with me okay. i just like straight up put okay this is the this is the chord and i don't really explain what kind of chord it makes up and in your preface yeah. note you also talked about like you showed a specific chord and said okay i'm not going to notate the, the the third partial i'm not going to notate um i think um there are some other partials that are like lower than just the seventh, I think, yeah. because it's a little bit... Yeah, you only lower. notate uh, a few partials that are farther away from equal temperament, mm -hmm. like the seventh partial, maybe the eleventh partial. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then you do say that there are going to be other partials in this that are closer to equal temperament, but those should also be played as if they're justly tuned. It's just that I don't notate them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you do add that note, which I think was helpful. Oh, I see. Yeah. So... I just don't think I explained it as thoroughly as you did. So I maybe mean, but also putting all these markings is more work. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, no. It's also kind of easier to say this entire section is um, mainly based on just intonation, maybe with that exception, or this voice is um, has a, a slightly different system. But yeah, when you listen to it, try to tune into this specific thing no it was smart because you would notate like certain uh, chord like you would put m you would put minor seven or you put minor nine or you put these different mm -hmm. uh at, at specific points and it just was a very personal kind of notation also it wasn't like this kind of cookie cutter notation where you just have like regular quarter tone notation mm -hmm. so i thought that was interesting um something i want to kind of steal too so Go ahead. i guess that's what i guess that's what the real the real purpose of the show is, is for me to steal from you guys um, no go ahead we all should share you yeah. know our discoveries yeah well and the other thing is i don't really i don't really see people talking about how they approach music i mean we see the final result which mm -hmm. i think is what score follower is really great at but yeah. what it, what is the behind the scenes way yeah. to get like how did you become you you know like how did how did this all happen <laughs> like and how do you bring your personal you know touch to it rather right. than just like following trends because i feel like sometimes when i'm talking to young composers they're just like okay what's the what am i supposed to write right now mm. and that's not really like right. what this is all about i never had problem with that no? i always had some ideas yeah i just had more problem with figuring out how to make them work but I, ne I never had this problem really but i feel like in your music you also you had the direction quite early on in in your composer career no with me i mean i felt at least in the beginning of columbia like 2017 i felt really lost because oh. i was writing in this like very traditional kind of style when i was at juilliard uh -huh. i thought um, well that's what juilliard does to you maybe no well, you know, you're kind of, that's what I'm saying. Like you're kind of, as a student, as a composition student, you're kind of like, you see what's around you. You can't help but follow what everyone else is doing, you mm. know? And then you're kind of influenced by what you're supposed to, like what everyone else thinks you're supposed to write. But I always, always interested in this like microtonal bent or this Arabic cultural bent that I always had. And it was always like, 
why also also thinking like why why am i doing this and constantly asking myself that but it was hard to have these kind of kind of conversations over there Mm -hmm. at juilliard i feel like because um a lot of the truth a lot of the stuff that we were exposed to was had nothing to do with things outside of western music yeah or even past like henry cowell or something like (laughs) past like early 20th century american experimental experimentalist composers so that was difficult but at columbia when i came to columbia you know uh, people seem to be um like not really caring what what anybody else thought they just were writing what they wanted to write mm-hmm. and in a way i feel like that has also influenced how the the, the new music world thinks of aesthetics Mm. which goes back to the score follower creation creation thing because then i feel like a lot of these pieces that i look at mm. on score score follower look like they've been written by columbia composers <laughs> so it kind of goes full circle in a way so then it makes me think what is the right answer <laughs> i don't know what it is i don't know if that makes yeah. any sense but um i mean it's interesting because when i look at our colleagues i feel like everybody is actually doing something else a lot of us like microtonality in general yeah. i think and that comes with the history of columbia in a way maybe but still i feel like everybody's working on slightly differently and also thinking other things are important to us you know i think recently that's true okay i think like the crop of students now but i'm just comparing it to like something very different like a juilliard or Manhattan mm. school of music or indiana university or name your like conservative more conservative yeah. uh, not to name names but it's just true you know more conservative places like there is a very big difference between mm. how like students at columbia or even the professors think about music than than any of these other places it's just that's just there right. and when you're embedded in one culture and you go to another culture culture but i mean like, like the institutional culture mm-hmm. i mean you really see it and you don't really see it when, when you're just in that. Like you've been at Columbia, for example, for what, four, four years. years now. So you only really see Columbia. But if you were yeah. at Juilliard or wherever before or even after, then you'll see, well, this is like, I'm, comp- I'm a composer here, but it doesn't feel like what I thought a composer is at this other place. So it's just kind of interesting. Like, and I feel like I have this battle with my music still constantly, hmm. especially when I'm writing music for a, a known institution it's like that struggle it comes back to me because it's like okay i'm i'm being pulled to sound more like a traditional composer when i feel like my head is somewhere else yeah because of my stay at columbia and studying with gay organ all that kind of thing oh i see well that's something we all struggle with to an extent i think because when you get a big commission it's so it's just it's a lot of pressure and then you start start thinking about your own style like what is what is like me you know and i kind of i try not to do that too much because obviously yeah it's kind of american actually to think of an institution or a person as a brand and i kind of don't want to go there you know because i just want to do whatever interests me and if I'm not consistent in it, too bad. But I just, I want to do it. I want to go on my own path. So in that sense, it's, it's dangerous always to get a, a big commission and you start thinking about it. Well, what did they expect of me? Why did they commission me? Maybe they want this kind of piece, you know? Um, maybe they like this piece of mine and I should go in that direction. Yeah, instead of like thinking of to yourself, what is like the, the next new direction i want to go in you think to yourself well maybe this is not the opportunity to do that maybe this is the opportunity to stay safe stay on the safe side yeah and this is what i have i have this problem because like when i wrote uh, my piece for international contemporary ensemble which was you know we wrote that piece for free and all that kind of thing and you kind of feel like Mm -hmm. you can do whatever the heck you want yeah that's how i felt when i wrote it and that piece for me has been very successful. It's won a lot of contests. It got me into Gadamus, this X, Y, and Z, and, and only a year, you know, that one piece. Yeah. But I had no pressure to write a piece that matched my aesthetic or whatever. I was just writing this mm-hmm. specific idea. And 
And it's very, very, very hard like to maintain that um, that mindset when you're writing a piece that, you know, especially you go into yeah. a five figure commission fee, you know, where it's like it actually affects your <laughs> I was just saying, because some of these fees, they get to that level. And it's just like, well, uh, this is like an actual substantial amount of money to me. Yeah. Like what I don't want to like piss them off like or think mm. I'm making the joke out of it. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I think about that a lot. So uh, it's it's difficult and it doesn't get any easier, I feel like the older you get yeah oh there's so much to talk about this like there's yeah. there's it's so kind of yeah. endless yeah i know but <laughs> yeah no i agree yeah but i think it's still better not to think about all this all this pressure or you know um just over analyzing i think it's still better to be you mm -hmm. because in the end it, maybe it's about trust for yourself too as a composer right. Like I can do it, even just doing things. Well, that we have a problem with trust too. I feel like we have a problem with the <laughs> self confidence and that kind of thing. Well, I yeah, think it's just, obviously. It, our, yeah. I think it's part of the nature of being a composer. Yep, every go everybody goes through that, I'm sure, at yeah. some point of life, and everybody goes through the moment when when they think, okay, what am I do gonna do with my life? Am I am I going to be a composer? Am I gonna be something else? And I'm gonna like try different things. Am I am I going to be in between? You know, but somehow you kind of have to make that decision, I think. And then, yeah, we need to trust ourselves once we decide. This is what I want to do. I think that that was my case. At some point, I I decided, and yeah, it's to been be working out. You mean now. to be a composer? To trust yeah. yourself to be a composer? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Or you mean trust yourself when you're writing each new piece? Or you just in general about being a composer? No, because I still have doubts about right, yeah. <laughs> writing yeah. a new piece. But trust myself to be a composer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really I mean, that's a, that, that's a great way to end the show, too. <laughs> so <laughs> trust yourself to be a composer if, uh, if, that's, if that's what you want to be. Check out Nina's uh, music down in the description below. I did include a third piece down in the description below that we didn't get a chance to check out. But right. um, listen to that, too, if you'd like to. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So nice to be here. <laughs>